Welcome. Good morning. Um, welcome to SDL History Live and our presentation today, Great Love Stories. Uh, that's a great way to begin this chilly morning. I'm Tammy Goldman, Director of Tourism and Visitor Experience. But today, um, I am your technical assistant. I'm here to ensure that the program runs smoothly. So fingers crossed. Um, as you all know, due to the present situation, nearly all of our programming is virtual. However, I do want to remind you the Missouri History Museum and Soldiers Memorial are open to visit Wednesday through Sunday. Because your safety is our top priority, the capacity to the buildings are restricted and we do require advanced reserves reservations. All tickets are timed entry and free, of course. But we do ask you to reserve in advance if you can. Just go to plan your visit on our website at mohistory.org. So before we begin, I want to start with a couple acknowledgments, a couple housekeeping notes, and then I promise I will turn this over to our host, Amanda. A special thank you to those in the audience that are tuned in today that are members of the Missouri Historical Society. We couldn't do what we do every day without your support. And we also appreciate the support from the Zoo Museum Tax District. We seriously and thank all of you um, for your tax contribution, those of you that live in the St. Louis City and County area. So I uh, quickly wanna mention a few details um, from the housekeeping side of things. In regard to our program today, it will run roughly about 30 minutes and will be followed by a Q&A session, um, 10 to 15 minutes where we hope to answer all of your questions. You can submit your questions through the Q&A button found on the bottom. Well, wherever your toolbar is located, that's where you will find the Q&A button. You can submit those at any time. Normally, I would say we would answer those at the end of the program, but Amanda loves to answer while she's going on. So as you think of questions, send them through and we'll do our best to answer those as we can. Today's presentation is being recorded. And if you'd like to view it again or share it with others, it will be posted very soon on the Missouri Historical Society's YouTube channel. Um, as always, your feedback is very important to us. So after this is over, we would appreciate your input. Um, so if you can just take a few minutes after the program, a Kobo toolbox survey will pop up in another tab on your browser. So keep an eye for it when you sign out when you leave this session. So that's all you have to hear from me. Let's get to why you're here. Today's program will be presented this morning by our community tours manager, my friend and developer of the CSTL tour program, Amanda Clark. So Amanda, let's hear about those great love stories. Thank you, Tammy. Hello to everybody. Let's get on to our, get going in this. So, um, So this is, oh, first of all, this is a, a lovely photo that I found in the Missouri Historical Society's archives. It's from a, perform a Shakespeare performance. And we've got, yeah, it's just a fun one to, to kick off love stories. Um, if you've never been on one of my tours, when I'm not doing talks like this for the Historical Society, I am also leading walking and bus tours um, for the CSTO um, progr tour programs. I hope to see all of you out this summer when it gets a little warmer out on the streets, although we are doing tours now. Um, and I've been with the Missouri Historical Society for just over a year. So this talk is one of my favorites. Uh, it's, and I'm going to have fun with the different kinds of love stories that come up in St. Louis history, some of them very romantic, some very tragic, and some that might make being single look a little appealing. Um, the talk today is going to hit on some of those famous stories that, you know, some of them are, are really well known, but I want to kind of maybe offer a different perspective on them. And then a few not so famous ones. Um, and again, so again, on those famous ones, hopefully we'll, we'll see a new look at it through the eyes of love. So we have to start here, right? Because for any other city in the US, like we kind of have a fun Valentine's Day connection in that we were founded on Valentine's Day, um, when Agashito and his men came up, the came up the river and, you know, decided this is the location we were going to have our village. It was, and scholars debate whether February 14th or February 15th. So we'll say it's Valentine's Day or it's, it's belated Valentine's Day, but still it's a cool connection uh, that our, our city has to Valentine's Day and this time of year. And they fell in love, right? They fell in love with the place. So there's that. 
And sticking with the Chouteaus, our first big love story. And this is one that, you know, it's the founda founding love story for our city and one that founds an empire. And it all is thanks to, you know, the woman on the right there, Marie Chouteau. It's, it's all, this, this whole story involves her and Pierre Laclede the guy on the left and then making some very unconventional choices to maintain the relationship and yet found an empire. So Madame Marie Therese Bourgeois Chateau, uh, the mother of St. Louis in a lot of ways, um, and Pierre Laclede, that's the guy on the left there, he's this is a statue that you can see downtown St. Louis at City Hall. From here on out, we're going to call her Marie Chateau, so I don't butcher that gorgeous French name of hers. So her story is really cool and fascinating. Um, well, the guys, you know, Auguste and Pierre, they're all about the fur trading and starting a village. She's all about being smart with her legal and marital status. And so that her kids go on to be some of the wealthiest and most influential families in early American history. But who is she? So Marie Chateau, if you can't tell from the painting, is a super serious lady. Um, she's born in New Orleans in the 1730s and her family arranges her marriage at 15 to Rene Chateau, an innkeeper and, bake, and baker. And they have a baby, Auguste Chateau. And from all accounts, it was a very unhappy marriage. There's um, allegations of abuse. There were they were miserable. And so he hightails it back to France and Marie stays put in New Orleans, um, which, you know, New Orleans in the mid 1700s is a single mom, not really an ideal situation. So, but she is smart enough to start calling herself the widow Chateau because she knows that in, under French customs and French rule, widows have a higher social status and she's able to maintain a little more control of her life and her finances. So she meets a man, another French immigrant with better prospects than Rene, um, and they start their own family. And that man is Pierre Laclede. Now she can't get married to Pierre because she's married, even though that's a, no one knows and she's calling herself the widow Chateau, she knows that legally she can't marry Pierre, but they start a family anyway. And he's obviously in on this. And what they do is they decide together is that all of the children that they have, and they have four children together, they, are bab they baptize them with her absent husband's last name, which comes in handy later. So as Laclede and some other people found the fur trading post in the village of St. Louis, she joins them soon after with the children. She acquires her own property. She has her own assets as the city is, is growing. And when her first uh, husband does finally die, making it legal for her to marry Laclede, she doesn't. She, and this is smart because when Laclede does die a few days later, a few years later, um, she doesn't have to assume any of his debt and she's able to go on to become incredibly wealthy herself and she ensures the wealth of her future generation. Um, she held large amounts of land, she traded in furs and grain, and she also owned a large number of enslaved workers. In the 1930s, family members published an article denying their illegitimacy and defending their mother's honor However, in my opinion, they totally missed the point because she made unconventional choices in the name of love and, and, and furthering her life. And that made the, the changing political and social landscape to work for her, she founded an empire. So for Madame Chateau, smartly managing that legal status and her first husband, you know, abandoning her and then having her children with Cleed baptized with her married last name, she becomes the founding mother of a village that was the fifth largest city in the country just under 150 years later. And when she does die in the mid 1800s, she has 50 grandchildren. So she loved, loved did them well. Our next, and again, as, as Tammy mentioned in the beginning, if you have any questions as we go along, I will check the Q&A um, before we move on to each topic. So we're gonna move on to the top, next topic. That's these guys. So this is the love story that changed the world. Um, definitely our, the world that we live in. Um, that's the love between Harriet Robinson Scott, that's on the right, who was for a long time just known as the wife of Dred Scott, a Missouri slave who ensued for his freedom and lost in 1857. But thanks to the work of modern historians and the way that we, as a society, we can re-examine these things, we can see that her incredibly important role in their story is now coming to light. So the two of them, they meet in Minnesota at Fort Snelling. They're both enslaved, but to different owners. And this is complicated because technically enslavement was not legal due to the Missouri Compromise. However, the federal fort had a large community of enslaved Africans and Native Americans. Anyway, 
Harriet was 17 and Dred was 40. Their wedding is really important because for Harriet pushed for them to have an actual civil ceremony versus just a traditional, um, traditional wedding. So they had an actual civil ceremony making them legally married. And that's something that was pretty common for enslaved people to be able to do. The fact that her owner was the justice of the peace definitely helped. They had four children together. They had two sons who died in infancy and two daughters who lived into, well into adulthood. When their owner dies, they're left to his widow who hires them out and heads to Massachusetts. And this is who they sue for their freedom. When Dredd filed his case in 1846, so did Harriet. They filed on the same day, two different suits. However, eventually their attorneys decided to consolidate the cases, which is unfortunate because now modern, again, modern attorneys and historians can look back at that and say, the fact that where she had lived and the fact that her owner had technically freed her through granting her illegal marriage would have made her case a much stronger one. Her marriage and her strong commitment to her family is what propels their case. I mean, she's interviewed later that after, you know, because she was a long time after they were granted their freedom. Concern for her daughter's futures, as well as the ability to stay together as an intact family was her priority. And in fact, the majority of freedom cases were brought by women, something that's attributed to the family and, and maintaining, um, keeping their children together. Otherwise, someone could try escaping to free territory, and not something that you'd risk with small children in tow. So during the 11 years that the Scots were fighting their cases, their daughters were kept safe in free territory, which makes the, this, this is one of the most intimate statues in St. Louis. This is a statue downtown um, on the east courts, on the east steps side of the old courthouse. Um, and I wish I could recreate the experience of standing next to this to you. I've been talking about the statue for this, almost a decade now, and I still can get choked up sometimes looking at the statue because there's so many beautiful artistic details that tell the story of their love, their intimacy, and their commitment to their family. The fact that their arms are reached around each other in an embrace, their hands in the front are clasped tightly together. They're looking off and they're looking over at Illinois where their daughters are. And so that those three things together really make this an incredibly moving story and a an, moving an statue. All right, no questions. And we and again, if you have questions at the end, I'm happy to, to talk about whatever. We can move on now to my favorite, these two crazy kids. Um, the lady on the left is Julia Dent, and her family home is across the street from what modern St. Louisans would call Grant's Farm, which is a total misnomer. Um, young and lean guy on the right, that's Grant. He's a you know, a promising officer when he's young uh, from a prestigious military academy in New York. Uh, Julia Dent, when she's young, is a plain, curvy, and cross-eyed, um, and she didn't have much in the way of a formal education. We've got these two people, but she was very warm and very self-aware, and Grant fell hard for it. Um, it took a while for their love to lead to marriage, because he had military assignments all over the place. Her father disapproved, but in 1848, they wed in downtown St. Louis. In his autobiography, he tells of learning that he loves her at the same time as being given military orders to leave St. Louis. He hops on a horse and heads to see her. He has to cross a flooded river, which soaks his clothing. Nevertheless, he borrows some dry clothes. He stops at a house, dry, borrows some dry clothes, and heads continues on to her house. He arrives at her door and clothes are way too big for him and declares his feelings, and she admits hers. And you know, they had met because her, his college roommate, you know, they're in St. Louis and he's like, hey, you gotta meet my sister. I think you'd really like her. So that's the kind of backstory on how they met. So this is how they, the proposal happened. You know, and Grant's life is often characterized as a drunk, a failure. He struggles in anything business related and he's way too trusting of those he dealt with financially and politically. But his commitment and love to his wife is legendary. And in the early days of their relationship when he was away with the military, he wrote her constantly. There's even a book just of their love letters now. And he was pretty insecure of their love and especially insecure of how he wrote, like he wrote her more letters than she wrote him. And this is something that made, made, uh, made him insecure, which I know is a weird feeling, but she always remained constant in her love and support. And they were apart for long amounts of time early in their relationship. Um, and this is something that grants, you know, it can be 
connected to Grant's reputation for being a hard drinker. It can be attributed to how hard it was for him to be apart from her, which becomes an issue again as he's rising the ranks during the Civil War. You know, he concludes that he's a better man and a better commander when he's around Julia. And so he sends for her at different times. She leaves the children's relatives and she travels to his encampment. She was over the course of the Civil War, she was with him at campaigns at Memphis, Vicksburg, Nashville, and Virginia. And her presence, you know, was known to lift his spirits and void his confidence. And she was just, they were better together. So much so that in 1864, when Lincoln appointed Grant commander of the Union armies, the president sent for Julia to join her husband because he knew the positive effect that she would have on him. Also, he could totally write a love letter. Some of my favorite lines from their love letters, this is one that arrives from Julia. There's one, you know, that he, he gets this, this letter from Julia, has two dried flowers inside. He opens it and the petals scatter in the wind. And he, he then goes to like search the sands. He's in Mexico at the time for even a single petal. They can't find it. So then he responds to her and he says, before I seal this, I will pick a wild flower off the bank of the Rio Grande and send you, he wrote. And later from another location, he says, you say in your letter, I must not grow tired of hearing you say how much you love me. Indeed, dear Julia, nothing you say sounds sweeter. And when I lay down, I think of Julia until I fall asleep, hoping that before I wake, I may see her in my dreams. Another one, my dear Julia, you can have but little idea of the influence you have over me, even while so far away. And thus it is absent or present. I am more or less governed by what I think is your will. They were married for 36 years. So you almost always see her in profile. And it's because she had an eye condition that made her leak the cross eye called strabismus. And there's a great, you know, a lot of evidence of, of Ulysses' response whenever she, you know, questions whether to have it corrected. Um, there's a point early on, the surgeon tells her that she's too late to correct the condition. She's telling Ulysses how sad this makes her. And he says, what in the world would put a thought, such a thought in your head, Julia? Why, you are getting to be, and she says, well, you're getting to be such a great man and I am such a plain little wife. And he says, I thought of, and, or she says, I thought of my eyes were as others are, I might not be so very plain. Grant looks at her and says, did I not see you? and fall in love with you with these same eyes. I like them just as they are. And now remember, you are not to interfere with them. They are mine. And let me tell you, Mrs. Grant, you had better not make any experiments as I might not like you half so well with any other eyes. Later, it, later in her life, surgery is an option. She consults a few eye specialists and she decides to go undergo the operation. Um, and to leave to go to Philadelphia, she packs her bags. She makes his choice, but she does let him know. Like, and he, he lets her, you know, make her own personal choices. But when she lets her know that she lets him know that she's about to leave to go to Philadelphia, she gets a little note from from Grant that says, "Dear Julia, I don't want to have your eyes fooled with. They are all right as they are. They look just as they did the very first time I ever saw them. The same eyes I looked into." when I fell in love with you and the same eyes that looked up into mine and told me that my love was returned. Julia unpacks the suitcase and cancels the appointment. Here's a, a picture of their family. And again, she's you know, usually turned off to the side. She's a little later and older in this photograph. So she's not quite so in profile. Um, you know, another, the ending chapter of their love story is, you know, he struggled in business, struggled with finances all throughout their life, but he writes his memoirs, right? That, that's one of the big stories with him is him writing these epic memoirs at the very end of his life as he's dying of throat cancer. And he hands them in just before he dies in 1885. And as they're turned in, uh, once they're sold and they're published and they go on, they go on to make Julia over $450,000. So even though he, he leaves her early with he has throat cancer and dies, he's able to give her this last kind of gift to make sure that she's taken care of for the rest of her life. So we're gonna to move to the next story. This is another very famous St. Louis story. Here's some headlines from October 16th, 1899. Negro shot by a woman, 
Allo Britt, Alan Britt dead from a knife wound inflicted by a woman. So these are the St. Louis News headlines on October 16th, 1899, the morning after one of the city's most famous murders happened. This is at 212 Targi Street. Um, and 212 Targi Street just happens to be, that photo on the right there is uh, the Kiel Auditorium and now the Enterprise Center in the back. That's all of that being constructed originally. Um, and so that's to just to let you know where it is downtown St. Louis, its exact location. So after a high spirited night, there was a fight between Frankie Baker, this is the lady here, and Albert Britt. And it ends with one person dead and a story that has been told, performed, and sang over 400 different ways that it's hard to know exactly what's true. But what everybody agrees on is that Frankie catches Albert with another woman, they fight, he attacks her, and she shoots him in self defense. The exact location of the shooting is now what is section 102, 103, and 104 of the Enterprise Center Concourse. A day after Albert dies, a pianist writes a song, Frankie and Alan, which is a very slow melody, eventually becomes the infamous story of Frankie and Johnny. The song was first published in 1904, and it was published by a Detroit, a white Detroit vaudevillian performer, Huey Cannon. It is responsible for over 400 recorded versions, books, stage productions, the first feminist ballet, a comic book, a radio series, television shows, and films, including one performed by the King of Rock, Elvis Presley. The story has been set in cities all over the world. However, it wasn't until John Houston wrote a stage production that Frankie and Johnny was rightfully connected back to St. Louis, where it all began. Because of the communal spirit of St. Louis musicians, the song has never been copyrighted and has spanned many generations to make the lost Chestnut Valley, which was the neighborhood that Frankie and Alan lived in there, Chestnut Valley, an important place and time in pop culture history. So that's the story of like the song. But Frankie, so Frankie Baker, she struggles most of her life. I mean, she goes through her trial, she's acquitted um, and, you know, but meanwhile, she, you know, she goes, tries to get on with her life. She moves to Portland. She has a business there. But all the while, there's all these people making money off of her, um, making money off of her story. Um, fine, as she gets older, she does try suing Republic Pictures for exploiting her life to gain millions on their movie. Um, there was an all-white jury. They decided against her claim. So she dies alone in Portland, Oregon, in a mental institution in 1950. The next story is one that I always like to uh, <laughs> like to say, love makes you crazy when you're already crazy. All right, so this is Mary Catherine Reardon on the left there. And Mary Catherine in that photo is 14 years old. And that is Michael Darcy, her boyfriend, who was 13 at the time of this happening. So they are crazy teenagers in love. Um, Mary Catherine convinces, this is in 1947, she convinces Michael that they need to run away together. And so they pay for a cab, takes them from St. Louis out to Wentzville. They get a hotel room. They think they're you know, in the clear, they're on the, they're on the run. And Mary Catherine's father finds out, somehow connects with the cab driver, finds out where she is and goes and gets them. So they're driving back to St. Louis, it's February 8th. And what can, probably is already the most awkward car ride ever, they're coming back. They're both in the back seat. Um, someone pulls the gun out from under the seat and shoots the father in the head, causing him to die, but also causing a car wreck that also kills Michael. So that's the, you know, the tragedy parts of it, part of it. Mary Catherine gets out of the car and immediately when the cops and everyone arrives, she calmly admits to the murder and says that her, she knew that her father was going to make her go to Catholic high school and she didn't want to. And so that's why she shot him. So there's this huge sensational trial. Kind of think of the, you know, although it's a different, a different type of murder and story, try to think of like Chicago, like that kind of thing. Um, and she is, you know, deemed by the new, by the media as too, uh, too cute to have done this. And she's this big personality, and and everyone's paying attention to her. So this is a story that is covered all over the country. This this murder and this story, and the the tales of her trial are very dramatic. And I can only find stories of her in the newspaper. She's, she's one of my personal research topics that I, I try to find evidence of her, but I can only find the newspaper. So then when she's 16, two years later, she, uh, you know, she 
runs away and elopes, but her mother makes this national call for her to come back. That's in the paper. So she elopes in, in, in Los Angeles with a singer. And then the papers, a few years later, they start to detail um, how she was, uh, ha she was caught for shoplifting in Los Angeles um, three years after the death of her father. This is her house in LA with her, her new husband there. So she's, co she's covered you know, over the years, her exploits. And then finally we see a divorce. And so we see um, that her husband, that she and her husband divorced. And this is where my, my trail ends for with her. And I can't, um, so yeah, if anyone out there knows more about Mary Catherine Reardon, I would love to know kind of what happens to her after this, uh, this whirlwind couple of years. So our next story, the tragedy that tore apart two loves and created the St. Louis suburb of Webster Groves. Um, I live in Webster Groves and the story is one that makes me, it's, it's kind of my, it's a fun one to tell people that live here because not a lot of people know about it. So in 1896, in the Northwest corner of Webster Groves, there's a man named Bertram Atwater who gets off the train from downtown St. Louis. He's visiting from Chicago. He's a commercial artist. He's here to do some drawings of Union Station. There are three boys hanging around a saloon named Brannon's Saloon. They decide to hold him up, like, you know, with guns as he walks from the station to his sweetheart's home in Lee Avenue. So this is his fiance, lives in Webster Groves. He's here to see her, he gets off the train. Initially, these three guys, um, they don't, when he gets off the train, they're like, hey, sir, like, you look like you need a haircut and stuff. Do you want us to hold your bags? And he's like, sure. So he goes and gets his haircut, gets cleaned up for her, and then they have, they're waiting for his, his bags and then they sneak up on him as he's walking to her house and on Lee Avenue. So if you're familiar with, um, with Webster Groves, they hide in some bushes, they jump out, but when they jump out, they have a gun pulled and he quickly pulls one as well. And there's shots are fired. One of the boys is shot, one of the boys shoots and kills Atwater. So that night, the townspeople of what's now Webster Groves, so these little communities that were in that area are horrified. They, they're so aghast, actually, that, you know, that they, such a thing could happen in their beautiful, idyllic community. They caught the three boys, and there was a, there was a plan to lynch them. And so, like, if you think of, you know, this is, probably, you know, this is an interesting chapter in, in Webster Groves history. So there's a plan, they plan on lynching them, there's a mob. So there is a quick thinking, um, a constable, because they don't have a official police officers out here, there's a constable who kind of kidnaps the boys away and he they had to travel all the way to Clayton under in the dark under disguise to get them safely to the jail. Two of the boys were eventually hung um, and it was the first double hanging at uh, the Four Courts building in downtown St. Louis and the third went to prison. So another something that comes of this is that the citizens of Webster Groves this area decide that this, it's time to incorporate to become an organized thing to get in order to get rid of the saloons and to hire full-time policemen. So they have a committee, they get their first mayor, they have their first city hall, all this stuff. And one of the things they did is they established such a high fee for the licensing of saloons. All saloons were gone from Webster before the end of the year. And the re regulations against saloons are something that are still felt in Webster Groves now. If you are to visit here, there are no bars that are not restaurants. You can go to a restaurant and drink, but there's no just standalone bars here. And that all connects to the shooting of Bertram Atwater. And as we wrap up, finally, a sweet and romantic love story of everyday St. Louisans living in North St. Louis in the 1920s. This is Louis Bruman and, or Louise Bruman and Gus Nolkin two sweethearts that were separated when they were young. Uh, they went on to have different lives, only to find themselves living on the same street across from each other 50 years later. Mrs. Broom was a 64-year-old widow. Mr. Nolkin was 65 years old and a lifelong bachelor, which we'll get to. And according to the newspaper story, it was Mr. Nolkin who figures, out, figures it out first that fate had brought him back to her. He watches her from afar because he realizes they live in North St. Louis. They live almost just across the street from each other. And he, you know, he recognizes her and this is 50 years later. And he realizes that there she is. And so he 
watches her from afar for a little bit. He approaches her on the street and reintroduces himself. They did a little courting, very short for a little short while, and he proposes to her. And when he proposes, he says that he had always been a bachelor because he wanted no one but her. And her response was that she needed to think it over for a few days. And he says, take as long as you like, as long as it's tomorrow. So they do get married. They live together at 3239A on North 20th Street, North St. Louis. They do go to Louisville on their honeymoon. And there's two great quotes in this story. Um, the first one from her, she says, the death of my husband almost killed me. But now I'm happy again. I have a companion who is kind, thoughtful, and I'm quite sure thoroughly happy for the first time in his life. And from him, he says, this is something he tells her, he says, Louise, I'm smiling when I leave and I smile all day at my work because I'm thinking of you and the streetcars don't run fast enough at night to get me home to you. So there's my whirlwind trip through some St. Louis love stories. I would love to get some questions about those stories. If you have any, any others that, because there's so many great ones um, that you want to contribute, you know, talk about. I'm happy to, and you can put it in the chat or the Q&A. So this is the end slide. So bring on your questions, please. I think this is when you have to do your song and dance until they can think a little bit more about the questions. <laughs> I'll sing a love song. <laughs> It was a great program. I really enjoyed it. Thank you. I'm a sucker for a good love story. So. <laughs> well, oh, here we go. Oh, how did Alan get turned into Johnny? This is a really, um, this is a really easy one. Frankie and Alan doesn't sound as good as Frankie and Johnny. Like it's one of those things that gets turned into a, a better, like the name sounded a little catchier um, as it as it warped and took on a life of its own. Good question. So Amanda, which one was your favorite love story if you had to pick? Oh, it's always Grant and Julia. That's oh, always okay. the answer. <laughs> <laughs> and those love letters were pretty, pretty romantic. It's it's and it's not just the love letters, it's also the, you know, love of, you know, just the idea of this like handsome, dashing man and this, you know, punk lady from St. Louis with her, you know, crossed eyes and how he loves her just so so passionately. That's um, the way she is. Mm -hmm. um, so where and when do I do tours? Right now I'm doing walking tours a couple times a week. You can find on the Missouri Historical History Museum's website uh, under CSTL. Tammy, if you want to put the link in the chat for those while I answer I the other questions. Let me just get the correct one. Yeah, so the next question is what happened to Atwater's sweetheart? Um, that's a good question. And it's one that I would love to find out myself. It was something, someone, she's someone I'm trying to find in the newspaper records uh, and see what, if she stayed in Webster. I, I'm also trying to find the address of where that happened so I can go and see what, you know, what is there now? Because um, Lee Avenue is definitely a thing in St. Louis, but I'm not clear as to exactly where there would have been a little ravine and a bridge. So there's some clues to it that I'm, I'm looking for. The next question is uh, interested in the Chateau story because the woman, um, yeah, Kate, th this is a great question. Teresa brings in the fact that Kate Chopin has stories. You know, later, Kate Chopin is writing um, in the, at the end of the 19th century, early 20th century, she's writing these very feminist, forward thinking stories of women. And a lot of them focus on colonial St. Louis women because her great grandmother was a part of the French aristocracy at the time. And so she had this insight until life then. And yes, and she's, so she's asking me, was it because she was in St. Louis and had lots of money? No and yes, yes and yes, no and yes, no and no. It's all those answers in that she's able to do this because, you know, colonial, the colonial period in New Orleans when it's French and Spanish and the government's kind of up in the air and just rules are up in the air because they're forming kind of a new society and things are, um, are a lot looser, but she's able to you know, hold on to some of that tradition, which was calling herself the widow's chateau. She's able to hang on to that. Um, 
And then all those kids are baptized before they get to St. Louis. And then when they get to St. Louis, they just stick with the ruse, right? Stick with the thing. Um, and then she, she does have, goes on to have lots of money because of her own good business sense and the, the situation that she has put herself in, in a good way. Um, when her original husband does come back from France at one point, he finds out what she's, you know, where she is and what she's accomplished. He comes here and she's able to petition the Spanish governor who sides with her and lets her keep being the widow Chuteau because of that money and social status. The thing about when she's in New Orleans, when she meets Laclede, she is the abandoned wife of a baker. And she's, you know, in her late teens, early twenties. So she really, through her own, you know, ability to, to, to buck tradition and, and to take advantage of the up in the airness of everything. Um, she uh, was able to, to, to do this. Can I spell out the names of the North St. Louis people? The, I'm going to have to switch my slide real quick and I can give you their names. The, the lady in the name is, uh, her last name is, um, it's Louis or Louise Bruman, B-R-U-M-I-N, or B-R-U-M-M, Louise Brum, B-R-U-M-M, and his name is Gus Nolken, N-O-E-L-K-E-N, and the address that they lived together was 3239A North 20th Street. And from the address, that I, I, I did some searching, the building's not there anymore. Okay, someone. One last question. Who was the author I just mentioned? Did I just mention an author? <laughs> I'd say lots of things. Um, if you could give, which, which connection, which story was, that, was the author connected to? So you're either talking about Grant or Chateau. Yeah, neither one of those. I remember mentioning an author, the Chateau. Oh, Kate Chopin. Oh yeah, Kate Chopin, C-H-O-P-I-N. And her writing is fantastic. And her, her big book is called The Awakening, which a plug for the walking tours. We talk about her on the Central West End Beyond the Ballot walking women's history walking tour. Good questions. Mm -hmm. So you have some things in the chat. Oh, oh. <laughs> thank you, Tammy. We do have some things in the chat. I do as told. <laughs> well, I hope everybody is staying warm because I'm not. I'm in the building this morning, um, as you might be able to see behind me, and it's very, very cold. I'm sitting here with a heater on my feet. So. <laughs> Nice and toasty. All right, it looks like we have no more questions. Thank you for the good questions. I always love the, it's one of my favorite parts of giving these, not just giving the talk, but also the getting to engage and answer questions. If you have any more questions, if you think of, um, you can, and I'll put this in the chat. Can I put this in the chat? Yeah, I'll put this in the chat is my email address. If you want to email me any questions, any feedback, I love it all. And if you have any questions about the tours. Thank you, Amanda. And as you can see, as Amanda put up on the screen, we have a lot of programs coming up and continuing. Um, tomorrow we have a chow and chat, continuing on this love story theme of uh, sweethearts in service. And um, just a wonderful variety of great programs that you will find every Tuesday and Thursday and every other Wednesday. So thank you again for joining us. Uh, we will see you soon. Thanks, Amanda.